25 minutes. Hi, uh, so this talk is about uh, TLS crypto offload to network devices. Uh, during this talk, I will focus on the transmit side of crypto offload. We have some work on the receive side, however, uh, due to the limited time frame, I will not discuss it during this session. We can talk about it offline later. Uh, so I will start with motivating this work, uh, crypto offload to network devices. Then uh, we'll review some uh, existing models for crypto offload. And finally, we will discuss the proposed solution, namely offload to the network device, uh, propose an API, and uh, have a discussion on the challenges and the problems that we encountered implementing a proof of concept for this model. So let's begin. Um, so for motivation, we've made a simple test where we compared two TLS uh, cipher suits where the first was AS128 GCM versus the null cipher suit where the null cipher suit uh, implements the TLS uh, record protocol <coughs> uh, and uh, it doesn't do the encryption. So it's sending plain text but it's still uh, doing the SSL protocol. So in the table, we have on the left column the cipher suit, uh, ASGCM, and the now cipher suit. On the middle column, we have a CPU time split to user time, system time, and uh, a percentage, user percentage. And on the right column, we have bandwidth. So we see that with ASGCM, we get only six gigabits, and with the now cipher suit, we get about 10. And the encryption, which is uh, done using ASNI in this case, and performed in user space uh, takes 0 0.54 seconds where using the null cipher suit it takes only 0 0.8. So uh, those numbers are somewhat different from what Facebook presented. Uh, I'll guess we'll discuss those uh, offline and uh, see why do, we, why do we see those differences. However, the amount of processing that is required for encryption is still significant. So offloading that this is still useful. So moving on to existing solutions, the first uh, existing solution is a TCP offload engine that supports TLS. Uh, TCP offload engines are generally uh, not uh, something that uh, is going to be accepted in the Linux kernel in the upcoming years. So uh, those solutions probably won't be upstream. And there are many, many reasons why uh, those solutions are inferior to other solutions. Uh, they, uh, they are not as robust as uh, the existing TCP stacks. They are difficult to maintain and update. Uh, and over the years, the TCP stack uh, in the user space has uh, improved greatly while uh, TCP offload engines uh, fail to keep up with the user implementation of TCP. Also, it lags behind on the congestion control and retransmission algorithms that are implemented in the user space stack. So for those reasons and others, uh, those solutions aren't accepted. Uh, moving on to another category of uh, encryption offload, those are memory-to-memory -memory encryption offload, where uh, the host uh, prepares special descriptors for uh, the data that needs to be encrypted, and those descriptors are read by a crypto device, uh, presumably a PCI card that uh, encrypts the payload and then provides a completion interrupt that the payload has been completed, uh, payload has been encrypted, and uh, then the host can resume processing, so uh, this round trip uh, over the PCI adds additional latency and also consumes additional resources that might have been used otherwise. Um, so this is why this solution is inferior. And moving on to our proposed solution, where the encryption is moved into the network device, 
And uh, in this solution, the NIC holds the encryption state uh, and it encrypts and decrypts packets uh, in flight as they move on through the network device. Uh, in this way, the ciphertext is never held in the CPU memory, so uh, the CPU uh, only sees the plain text data and the network always sees the encrypted data. Uh, we have a single PCI round trip, uh, unlike the memory to memory model. Uh, and overall, we reduce latency since encryption isn't performed on the CPU host. So, before jumping to the software stack when using offload, let's review, review once again the TLS record protocol, uh, specifically with the use case of KTLS presented in the previous presentation. So the user space provides a big chunk of data, which is fragmented to 16K pieces by KTLS. So here is a transition between user space and kernel space. Uh, those uh, 16K chunks are later encrypted and authenticated uh, in KTLS. Then the TLS record header is added. And finally, uh, those uh, data pieces are pressed into the, T, uh, into the TCP stack where they are segmented to MSS chunk pieces and transmitted over the network. So how is this modified when we add uh, the crypto offload to, uh, to our kernel? So uh, first of all, our approach integrates with the KTLS. So we added another uh, socket option for offload. Uh, and once this is specified, then uh, all the crypto state is passed to the hardware. And uh, from that moment onward, this uh, KTLS connection is being uploaded. So uh, the user provides plain, state, uh, plain text data to KTLS. Uh, KTLS uh, prepares records. So it adds the uh, authentication tag from the previous slide and the TLS record header. However, the plain text remains the same and those TLS records, the plain text records, are uh, passed uh, into the TCP stack uh, where eventually they reach the NIC as TCP segments and those TCP segments uh, will uh, be encrypted by the network device once they leave the device. So uh, we support currently only ASGCM. Uh, there are issues with supporting ASCBC. However, with TLS 1.3, those ciphers will be deprecated and uh, only ciphers as ASGCM and uh, Chacha Poly, which are, uh, supported, which are supported by this device, uh, will be supported in the future. So we don't see a problem with it. Uh, overall, the software stack remains uh, unchanged. Uh, maybe even simplified since KTLS doesn't need to deal with the encryption at all. And uh, the TCP IP stack is unchanged. The congestion control, the memory management all remain the same. So we keep the benefits of having all the control in software where the device is limited to uh, a set of encryption operations and decryption operations. So uh, moving on to a comparison of uh, TLS crypto offload compared to other uh, encryption protocols that are somewhat different. Uh, for example, IBSEC and DTLS are packet-based encryption protocols, meaning that each packet could be encrypted uh, independently of any other packet. Uh, however, uh, with uh, TLS, uh, it is uh, different where in TLS each record uh, is encrypted uh, individually and uh, as you can see on the right side uh, where we have two TLS records uh, which are split into three TCP packets. Uh, in order to encrypt packet P2 we need to have the encryption state at the end of packet P1. So there is a dependency uh, so when we need to encrypt packet P2, we need some state from a previous packet. So uh, hardware needs to maintain intermediate record state uh, for each TLS record. Uh, so moving on 
to how we implemented it in the driver. So there are two paths, a fast path and a slow path, uh, where for the fast path, where we do the following. We first check that the socket is uh, being offloaded, uh, whether than a new uh, member of the socket, SK offloaded. If the socket is offloaded, we proceed to the following check that checks if the TCP sequence number uh, is matching to the expected TCP sequence number. Uh, from the moment of offload, we are tracking the expected TCP sequence number uh, in the driver. So we, uh, in order to encrypt uh, a packet, if the, up, if the packet being sent uh, is the following packet, is the in-sequence packet, then uh, this packet can be encrypted without any additional work, and we get all the benefits of offload. However, uh, when the second check fails, meaning that the TCP sequence number isn't the expected TCP sequence number, so we need to do a, a little bit more work. We call this flow a uh, resync flow, uh, where we need to fix the TLS context in hardware. So hardware maintains a running TLS context for uh, a TLS socket, and uh, if, for example, packet P5 is being retransmitted for some reason, then uh, in order to offload the encryption of this packet, we need to fix the hardware TLS context. Uh, so the way we do it is that we need to provide the data of TLS record number two uh, in order to encrypt packet P5. So this includes uh, packet P4 and a part of packet P3. Um, so this is the slow path, and we need access to this data of TLS record number two. Um, so the requirements for this switching is that software needs to keep track of TLS records and to provide a mapping from an SKB to the first TLS record that uh, is part of that SKB. Finally, uh, this, we need to prevent the release of data from TLS record two even though packets P3 and P4 might have been acknowledged previously, uh, they cannot be released from memory since packet P5 might be retransmitted and we will need to access this data later. So schematically, when we are doing a recent flow for uh, SKB number two here, uh, which consists of uh, three uh, SKB fragments uh, where the first it has a, uh, some piece of data from TLS record one and some piece of data from TLS record two, and the other two are coming from TLS record number two, uh, then uh, the recent flow will need to have access to TLS record number one and provide data that is pointed to by SKB1, which is from TLS record one, uh, and this data must not be released from memory, even though SKB1 might have been freed uh, or released previously. So our proposed solution is to divide the implementation in the following manner between KTLS, TCP, and the driver. So KTLS holds a reference for the TLS record data. TLS, uh, KTLS provides uh, those pages to the TCP stack. So it builds those pages initially, and it takes an additional reference to those pages. Uh, and uh, this reference is used in a mapping between uh, TCP sequence numbers and TLS records, uh, where this mapping will be later used by the driver. Uh, the mapping is ex exposed to the driver so it can access it. Uh, from TCP, we require uh, an additional callback used by KTLS. Uh, this callback is uh, used to re release acknowledged TLS records. So when TCP is releasing memory that has been acknowledged it uh, goes through uh, an additional call to KTLS where we check if the record has been acknowledged completely and then we can release the memory from this record. Uh, finally, the driver will check if a resync is required uh, and if it is, it will query KTLS uh, to get the required data for the resync flow. Uh, so this slide so, shows some preliminary uh, performance results, uh, which 
we got uh, only just now uh, using uh, this offload method. Currently, we support uh, only uh, small records. So this is very initial. However, with time, we will have uh, more advanced results. So in the table, we see uh, a comparison between TCP, GNU TLS, which is a user space implementation of TLS, uh, kernel TLS, a somewhat old version from three months ago, and KTLS with offload support, uh, and the rows show throughput and CPU. So with TCP, we see uh, from 10 to 23 gigabits per second. Uh, it, th those all measurements are from the transmit side only. So the CPU is 100% uh, in all cases. With GNU TLS, we see 5 gigabits. With KTLS, 4. And with offload, we see 8. Uh, again, those are uh, the results for ASGCM with small TLS records. Uh, with larger TLS records of 16K, uh, we might see some, somewhat different results, but in any case, the offload of encryption is still going to be significant. Um, so some discussion items uh, regarding the implementation. Uh, the first challenge we have uh, and we didn't know how to cope with is routing changes. All uh, packets being offloaded uh, which our plain text must not go to a different device. So if the routing decision changes uh, during transmission, uh, we need to either have somewhat, uh, some way to do a software fallback or a, a manner to prevent this routing change for those packets. Uh, so this is the first challenge. Uh, the second challenge is uh, whether we need to add a, a new uh, protocol family, AFK TLS offload, since uh, in the current implementation, the way we did it is simply add uh, an if uh, to the uh, KTLS send message and send page calls, where uh, we check if it's offloaded, we call one function, otherwise we call a different function. It might have been simpler to just have another socket family and that's it. Uh, the third uh, uh, discussion item is uh, the use of the original TCP socket which uh, Dave mentioned in his presentation as well, where uh, the socket uh, is being destroyed uh, if uh, there is uh, some uh, handshake message or alert message in KTLS. Um, well, for offload, this also presents a problem if someone is using the original uh, TCP socket while the socket is being offloaded. Uh, we expect to encrypt all the payload that's going out of the socket and if the original TCP socket is used, then the user is supposed to encrypt it, and that presents a challenge. Uh, we could, could overcome this in many different ways. We just need to decide what is the best, since even uh, protocol messages, which aren't application data, they are still being encrypted, and the benefits of encryption offload will apply to this case as well. Um, the first item is memory accounting, since we need to do the accounting of the TLS records, which are maintained in KTLS. Uh, how would we approach this problem? And the last item, I have some slides for it, uh, zero copy send file. Uh, will be possible using crypt offload, that's what I've tried to mention earlier during Dave's talk. When we do send file and we use encryption, then the encryption, you can think of it as a copy since you can't encrypt the data that's in the page cache. Uh, you can think of it as encryption and not as a copy, but it's somewhat similar. So we, we could get a zero copy send file when we use encryption offload, where we use the original data from the page cache uh, that is being sent in the similar manner to what we do with send file using TCP. Uh, and I have some slides that show a, a particular issue regarding this problem. So I'll go over the slide, and then we'll come back to the discussion items. So when we do a zero copy send file uh, with uh, crypto offload, then uh, KTLS adds the TLS header, uses the data from the page cache, and adds a dummy authentication tag that is going to be filled by hardware. And uh, when we send the payload, then it is encrypted by the network device. However, it is possible that some packet has been dropped uh, while others have been received by the other side. And 
once we have a retransmission, then with hardware offload, uh, we will do a resync and the authentication tag will be calculated for the new payload. However, the receiving side might have received some of the old payload, so the authentication tag check will fail because we will have uh, like mixed uh, payload on the receiving side. Uh, while uh, if we didn't use crypto offload, we wouldn't have this problem because all the data has been encrypted. You can think of it as a problem or, uh, or a benefit because uh, the receiving site doesn't receive uh, data that is both stale and new. It identifies this problem and has an authentication tag failure. Uh, however, it is still a peculiar, interesting issue that occurs only with TLS offload. Uh, another benefit of using crypto offload is obviously you don't see ciphertext when you're using TCP dump. So uh, you could see the plaintext data and perform manipulations of plaintext data. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. I'll return to the discussion slides for any questions. Uh, Mike. Um, is the offload actually uh, work on the virtualized environment as well? Uh, well, we haven't considered uh, uh, environments like SRIOV with this use case. I believe it is completely possible since there are no special challenges with providing the crypto context. However, we didn't consider it thoroughly uh, with the resource management of virtual machines, etc. Okay, um, what about like, you know, Docker environment and stuff like that? And um, is there any security concern? I mean, if we actually try to offload to the hardware? No, I, I don't think it will be any problem. It's just another service provided by the kernel. The kernel of the virtual machine could do this preparation for offload and the device could support it. So you mentioned in the slide here about a new protocol family. Please avoid this because that's the last thing we want to do. Uh, if we're going to add a new facility that provides TLS over TCP sockets, it has to be consistent regardless of whether there's a hardware offload behind it or not. It should be completely invisible to the application because it's one thing to get all applications and libraries out there to add support for AFK TLS. It's it's going to be impossible and a serious burden to add two new mechanisms for supporting this. I don't think it's reasonable to have two. Okay. Um, I agree. As for the zero copy send file situation, I th my personal opinion is that it's it's re we shouldn't support it because obviously the data can change from underneath the application. We don't want to lock pages down. That's the whole reason we do send files, because it doesn't synchronize with the page cache at all. There's no locking involved. There's no synchronization. And as you showed, it, it's, we would need to have the entire security context and retransmit the older packets to fix this up if the content changes underneath. The only other way you could, you could work around this is to copy, and you're trying to avoid copy in the first place. I think it's not desirable to have stale data on the receiver side. I, I totally agree change. with you. So I think the model, you're going to have to do a read and a write to do crypto offload over the TCP socket. And that's why I talk a lot about the, the doing uh, in the crypto layer assembler versions that do copies directly in and out of user space because for commodity hardware, that's going to be the fastest implementation possible in my personal opinion. So I really don't see a solution for the zero copy send file situation where the data can change underneath as it can. So unless someone comes up with a brilliant idea, we might have to punt on that for now. Can you go back on your slide? You mentioned TCP, uh, RTX, clean, something. Ah, uh, yeah. So call car TLS and TCP clean RTX Q to release acknowledge TLS records. What does it mean exactly? We call them to the whole TLS block for all the packets that refer to the whole block because that's the only way that we set the hardware. So the problem we can have with this is that you can receive a malicious hack. Um, the receiver can pretend uh, 
the, the, the buffer was and why it's still in your NIC transmitting. So the risk is you could actually free memory why it's still in use by the NIC. Uh, I don't understand. The memory... A NAC packet can be sent in advance by, by a malicious receiver pretending he actually got the packet. Okay. So you could have a race here and free something which is still in use by the NIC and so you could crash the host. The, the NIC is not saving the data. It's not, uh, it doesn't have any additional reference beyond what exists today. So at what point we use this extra data? We use KTLS. this. Um, yes. KTLS, when it uh, builds the TLS records, it takes an additional reference on the data that it has constructed. So once uh, the data is passed into TCP, when TCP uh, decreases the reference count for the uh, SKB frag, uh, the data is not freed yet because KTLS holds a reference for this data. And only when, when this function is called uh, for KTLS, it checks if a TLS record has been fully acknowledged and then the TLS record is freed. The final S SKB free frees the shared info, which frees the reference to the... So how I, so are you sure it's, case, uh, are sure it's going to work with the GSO uh, being disabled, TSO disabled, or whatever? No, so it's, it's completely... So I, I don't I understand why do you need to store that in the ah, SKB. Okay, so the I'll place. repeat uh, the problem. Uh, when you need to resync uh, the state of encryption, for example, here, uh, when you send SKB number two and the hardware uh, doesn't have the state to encrypt it, it needs to get the state, and the state uh, is present at uh, record one, uh, in the data of record one. So we keep record one in memory until SKB number two is acknowledged by TCP. Yeah, so I, I'm telling you, the SKB can be acknowledged while all this is still in flight. It doesn't so matter. So you need something else. On to the reference to packet three. It, packet should, it, three, packet it should be three. automatically freed when the SKB is freed, not uh, adding some hook in the RTX, TCP, or whatever. It's, it seems racy to me. No, he's There's some race. As a side effect of the normal free of the SKB that we do, it really? releases. Really? Yes. yes. Exactly. Okay. So ma Thank maybe you. <laughs> this is a better explanation. Clear. So just to be clear, so what you're talking about is you're having to maintain so, for example, your TLS record one is shown as occupying essentially three pages in this example, or three scattered other elements. Yes. <clears throat> what you're having to do is make an extra call to free record one once you've transmitted uh, the third page in that sequence, right? Once it is acknowledged. Right. So, see, he's ha he is having to free something extra above and beyond, but the pages should stay as long as SKB one is in there. So, he's holding two counts on each of those pages is what he's doing. Right. Well, no, the, he's saying the KTLS has to free record one once he's transmitted the third scatter gather element in there because then he's fully transmitted uh, record one and he no longer needs the data from it and can then move on to record two. I thought that the idea is that uh, all these SKBs have an extra reference to the TLS record from the beginning of it, like as an object, as a separate object, and then inside K-free SKB, when the final reference goes away, both the device's reference and the retransmit queue's reference goes, it pops out the shared. So you're just talking about an extra destructor then, essentially? Some extra destruction like the NF bridge info and all the other crap. Yeah, because it just sounds like the driver is doing some sort of custom thing where it's calling into KTLS and doing its own destructor from the sound of it. No, we did it with the, the pages. Uh, is there a problem if you're doing it with page references? Well, no. As long as you release it only when the last reference to the SKB goes away. Yeah, well... It has to happen on the, the ref count go to zero because other people can be referencing it at other places of the stack. Well, you take reference as long as you're using those pages. So. Right, but the TCP stack has a reference too on the retransmit queue and you'll have a reference when you're transmitting. And yeah, I'm saying that the important issue is that when only when all of these things go away can you release that, that yeah. data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you.